Good morning, brothers and sisters. Welcome to the Monday edition of this week's study. As we continue looking through these articles and analyzing to see what we see and how we would approach what is being presented, shall we ask our Heavenly Father for his guidance so that we might have wisdom at this time to truly understand what we need to understand. Shall we pray? Loving Father in heaven, we join together, we come before you, and thank you for the many blessings that you are providing. We ask now, Father, for your wisdom through the Holy Spirit, so that we might truly understand how to make sense of the document and the points that we will read. Help us, we ask. Direct us, we pray. May your angels attend us. May we be able to keep in mind that we need to be able to explain the positions that we have to all of those around us, whether they are in the movement, in the church, or outside of the church. Thank you, Father, for the many blessings that you provided yesterday and for the blessings and the mercies that you are providing for us today. Help us to this end. Guide us, we ask. For this, we thank you and we praise you. In the name of Jesus, amen. Okay. Now, the first sentence seems to set forth the thesis for this document. Atheism and Islam each hold a prominent position within the Adventist interpretation of Daniel 11, 31 to 45. Depending on the specific interpretation, one or the other is usually assigned to the King of the South in verse 40. In this article, we are going to take a closer look at the role of atheism and Islam to see if either one of them can actually fulfill the role of the King of the South. What's missing from this from this first sentence? Well, well, okay. So atheism and Islam each hold a prominent position within. Well, some Adventist interpretations. I mean, obviously, atheism atheism is part of it. I, I don't know about. I mean, Islam. I guess he would just be referring to Turkey. Is that what he's saying? Well. I think he's going to try to develop it in that way, but Islam as a whole is not Turkey as a unit. Yeah, well, even when you when you deal with, I mean, we'll probably get into this a bit more, but when you deal with the king of the north as Turkey, it definitely, because it's a territory and not a system, that's one of the problems I, I sort of had with with that interpretation, because now you're not really dealing with, uh, like you're dealing with a totally different type of power. And and the question is, why would Turkey all of a sudden be a part of Bible prophecy? Or even in, in that context, um, you know, you would say, well, Islam in that context, in, in that whole context there, because we know Islam has a role in Bible prophecy, with the judgments upon Eastern Rome, right? Okay. Okay, and Islam has a thread because there's a symbolism that's attached to Islam. But when you look at that whole section of Daniel 11, uh, you know, 36 to 45, it doesn't seem that that's talking about the same characteristics as the power that we see in Revelation 9. There's there's nothing symbolically that holds us to that. You, under, you understand what I'm saying there? Yeah. Like we have all, all these symbolisms attached to Islam, you know, the horse, uh, um, you know, the wild the, the wild ass, um, uh, locusts, uh, you know, scorpions. You know, there's lots of symbolisms attached to them, and and, and also the role that they play in uh 
protecting God's people from the Sunday law, right? That that sort of symbolism. And it doesn't really make sense in, in those verses to put Turkey as the king of the north and, and put Islam there. But then you have the other people who put the king of the south as Islam, right? Okay. Right. So 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 and here he's talking about the role of Islam or atheism in Islam to see if either one of them can actually fulfill the role of the king of the south. So so it, you know, so some have Islam as the king of the north, some have Islam as the king of the south. I don't know. I I, I don't know if I would start off with that sentence, but what what do you think's missing, I guess, or anyone else? Well, if we step back a little further, what was missing in Smith's understanding of the king of the north and the king of the south? Well, the change from uh, literal to spiritual. But could we also not say that Smith, because he refused anything having to do with the seven times, that he did not properly understand the conjunction of the daily and the abomination which maketh desolate. And therefore, he could not understand the progression of the king of the south. Well, yeah. And and so one of the things we pointed out is we know, you know, before the cross, you know, we have the literal after the cross, spiritual, right? That idea. Now, within the counterfeit, right, that is the two 1260s, are counterfeiting Christ's covenant week, right? So I call it the the, the satanic covenant week. Um, it's just something I labeled it as the, the 2520 for Northern Israel. And so what you have after 538 is you have a spiritual Babylon, right? You're going to not be applying the king of the north and the king of the south and all those things that we have when we study Daniel 11, we're dealing with, you know, Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and um, pagan Rome. And when we're dealing with Greece, we're dealing with the literal king of the north and the literal king of the south. Now, the papacy becomes the king of the north, or, or, or paganism does first. But then when you have the papacy, you now have to look at it spiritually. It's not about the territory. It's about the characteristics, Right. Same with the king of the south. It's the characteristics. Um, so, you know, Sodom and Egypt, those those two symbols. Um, but as far as the sentence itself, uh, it, it's, I mean, where he's having the difficulty is he doesn't really just seem to understand what it is he's trying to say. What he's attempting to do would seem to be to walk a line between a couple of positions so that he's not offending those that hold either of these positions. He's trying to get the favor of both groups. Okay. And... Now, sometimes you have to communicate an idea and yes. you don't want to communicate it in the most, uh, in a way that's going to create prejudice right away. Right. So, you know, there's ways of sort of disarming people's prejudice. I mean, that's, that's, and, and I don't consider that deception or, or manipulation. Um, you know, an example was, you know, why there's not a 25, 20 year period of, of, uh, 25, 20 period of, um, of continual punishment for literal Israel found in Leviticus 26. Now, I wrote that title because there isn't, but I knew that people reading it might not understand. They might think that it was a paper against the 25, 20. So somebody might argue that I was being deceptive, except that there's nothing deceptive about the title. Other than the person holds an opinion, a false opinion about what we actually teach. Right. But then I'm very clear in presenting 
the prophecy of Leviticus 26. There's no compromises being made in, in my thinking in order to pacify anyone. Um, another paper I wrote uh, dealing with uh, 538 on the 1843 charts, I actually wrote two papers on it. Now, the first one was, um, I think, in 2015 when there was this, uh, um, might have been 2016, I'm trying to think, when I wrote that paper. Anyway, um, you know, I'm, I'm clearly showing why we need to understand that 538 is a fall to fall year and not a January 1st to, to um, December 31st year on the chart just as 1843 is from spring to spring year, right, at the bottom of the chart. Um, and, you know, so I would say that often I'm trying to bridge a gap between uh, people's understandings and their biases, but to present a truth. What you don't want to do is uh, just try to well, do what the evangelicals did in, or the, the Adventist church did in their meeting with the evangelicals in the 1950s. Because what you do in, in that approach is you, you, you fashion your view or your argument in a way that people with actually differing views or opposing views will agree with you. Right? Okay. Um, and are you saying that to some degree he's doing that? He's modifying the way that the view is expressed or, or he's trying to, because he's not just trying to, to teach what he believes uh, directly. He's, he's trying to satisfy both groups, even if they're still going to continue to be opposed. That's what it looks like to me. You're thinking. That's my opinion. Okay. Yeah. So that is possible that that's that's what he's doing, and and I understand this. I mean, I tend to lean towards the peacekeeping role when it comes to, like like the middle ground when when I see people pose. I try to understand both people's position when they're in a disagreement, um, but sometimes they do actually disagree, and, and the question is why do they disagree? So that's the thing that, you know, from the time I was a child, I tried to understand why there is a dis why sometimes people can think very much like they can be in agreement about some things, but in disagreement about other things. It's always really puzzled me. So my belief when I was younger was just that people lacked information. That the reason why people uh, didn't think correctly is they just they just needed to be informed. It took me some time in my 20s to recognize that actually there was an emotional element into why people uh, have certain beliefs. That it really didn't have to do with the information. Because you can have people with the same information, but with a different set of biases, and they're going to interpret it differently. So, so part of what we would do in, in understanding the truth ourselves. So first, we have to understand truth. We have to recognize our own uh, uh, elements that are affecting why we believe certain things. Right? Is it is it because we we believe certain things because there's a group that believes certain things? So we need to uh, align our thinking with that group to be accepted. Is it that there's some emotional thing that something that uh, I don't want to deal with, maybe emotionally? Maybe even just the sin in our lives that's going, if we take a certain position, it's going to affect the decisions that we make and choices that we have made that we don't want to change, right? So there's lots of factors involved. And so I think in presenting the truth to a person, um, I mean, one is we need to be aware that people have these sensitive areas, but uh, first, we have to do it with ourselves and then just allow God to work on a person's heart and convince them. So he's the problem I have is he's not presenting any kind of strong argument for anything. Right. Correct. Like, so he hasn't said, 
here is my view and here's what I believe. So we're still not really even sure at this point. We're in part 10. We're not even sure what position he's taking on these things yet. Correct? It's very correct. Yeah. I mean, the issue that I'm seeing here is that not only is he unwilling to present his own view, he's also set aside a very prominent primary view that was presented by James White. Right. So he's not addressing James White's view. You're correct there. Because, you know, he talks about these dilemmas and these problems, but he doesn't actually really tell us anything about them. We don't really know what's going on at this point of his presentation, where he's going. He definitely hasn't presented the reality on the ground of where the issues are. Right. Right. So, you know, he skirts around the issues. He seems to be building kind of this, I guess, fortress of defense so that when he finally tells us what he thinks, that you're going to not be mad at him or at least understand where he's coming from. At least that's what he thinks he's doing. Right. But but it's it's not it's not the way that I would do it anyway. I mean, I'm going to be a lot more straightforward, but also sympathetic. I mean, you can be straightforward and sympathetic and say, you know, you don't have to be attacking and you don't have to be polemical. You don't need to be vicious when you present your ideas. Some people have a hard time not being vicious. That is mostly it's, you know, talking down to people and, you know, when they have an opposing view. And and that's one of the reasons, you know, I always talk about I always talk in the first person plural when I write a paper. I don't know if you notice I never use the word I. Right. Or me. It's always us and we. I don't know if you ever notice that. You know, which I think is is the best way to look at it is that we're sort of on a journey together. We're examining something together. We're not enemies. So. So. But here in. And he sort of tries to do that in some ways as well. Right. In this article, we are going to take he doesn't say I'm going to take a closer look. Right. So you can see the inclusive language there. Not inclusive in the, you know, politically correct realm. But he's not presenting clear ideas. And so it's not helpful. I don't see how anybody is going to be benefited by reading this, that he's going to change anybody's mind or help them think through the problem. And I don't and I don't think he's I think he's still going to alienate the people with different views. Right. I don't think that. I mean, they might not be really mad at him, but. They're not going to feel that he understands their position. So this is quite a bit different than when we studied David H. Steele's uh, paper, because his was way more polemical, very attacking, very condescending, very critical, very misrepresentative, uh, dealing with individuals and their motives. Um, So here we have quite a contrast. Um, But at least with David H. Steele, you knew where he stood. Here we don't know where he stands exactly. Right. Okay. So his next statement, these two entities are usually considered from the perspective that the King of the South fights against the King of the North. And then the King of the North responds with overwhelming force. According to the leading Adventist interpretations, the papacy moves from being the King of verse 36 
and then assumes the position of the king of the north. And this is where the role of either atheism or Islam comes into play, as one or the other must then become the king of the south. This becomes the focal point of their interpretations. Now, the reliance upon, and I quote, the leading Adventist interpretations is a problem. Well, I don't even know, is, is there a leading Adventist interpretation? That's part of my point. Yeah, because I would say that the leading Adventist interpretation <clears throat> But we have no idea what this passage means. Now, there has been, I think, in reaction to, to our position, the movement that this position has, uh, that this idea that Islam is the king of the South has become popular within the last few years. But uh, definitely, I, I'd never actually seen that interpretation uh, within Adventism in the past. So, it, and I think part of it just had to do with what was happening with Islam in the news. Well, here again, because of, of what he's presented previously and because of other issues that have arisen over the last 10 years, he's had a reliance upon the understandings of Uriah Smith. And if we're going to accept Smith's position, then we have to, again, set aside all understanding of the seven times and its conjunction between the daily and the abomination which maketh desolate. In other words, we wind up setting aside the premise that Rome establishes the vision. Mm -hmm. Now, either way, for now, if the king of the south is pushing against the king of verse 36, which is identified as, as the papacy, or is pushing against the king of the north, which by popular interpretation has become the papacy, it is safe to say that the target of the king of the south is the papacy it is in right. this so so in the interpretation that the king of the north is the papacy right then the king of the south is the one pushing at it whoever it is okay right um uh, so if the king of the south is pushing against the king in verse 36 now, of course, we know Uriah Smith's position is that the one that's being pushed at and pushing is, is France, right? Okay. Or, or, or it's being pushed at. So it's going to be, you know, Turkey's going to push against France, and then Egypt is going to come against France. Right? Is that how it goes? So... <clears throat> So what, what is he doing here? Like, I mean, he, for somebody who, who doesn't know anything about these verses or the issues or the controversies, he hasn't actually explained any of this. He hasn't explained Uriah Smith's view, actually. Right? Well, let, let's, let me put it this way. If there had been a, a huge reliance on the views of Doug Batchelor, or if there had been a reliance on the views of Mark Findlay, or Leroy Froome, or Roy Allen Anderson, we would have seen elements of what <clears throat> these prominent presenters had offered. But here what we're seeing is a, an amalgamation of different aspects of all of these presenters along with that of Uriah Smith. 
Yeah, and so so one is there's no real Bible study here. Correct. That's one of the problems I've had with with reading through his papers is he's not giving us a Bible study. He's just discussing about the different views that people have and and the implications of those views. But the question that we need to know is just what does the Bible say? Okay. But that's what we need to answer. So, so hmm. when he makes this statement that is it it is in this context that we are going to examine the role of atheism and Islam. In other words, it is in the context of the view of other men that we are going to examine the role as we see it of atheism and Islam. Right. So here we have, we have this, there's the truth that this verse has, and we're not going to look at the verse and really try to understand it, the whole context of chapter 11. We're not going to deal with the minutia. What we're going to do is we're going to say, well, here are some uh, different views. You got a views that the papacy is the king of the north, and the king of the south is either atheism or Islam. So let's look at whether one of those is better than the other. Right. Okay, which would be a, not a great way to study this. But it's very common how people study. Like what he's doing is not unusual. No, I agree. It is. Well, and, and it usually comes from what we call a false dichotomy. You know, there's a view. Some person has this view, some has this view. Well, which one seems to us to make the most sense? But how do you know either of them are correct? Exactly. Yeah. <clears throat> Okay. There are two overriding principles to consider when assessing the role of, athe of atheism and Islam. First, they must be considered in the greater context of paganism, papalism, and apostate, apostate Protestantism. Both Daniel and Revelation clearly lay out the role of these powers, their ability to persecute God's people, and how these powers accomplish their work in our personal lives. It must also be remembered that pagan Rome, papal Rome, and the USA apostate Protestantism are the fourth, fifth, and sixth kingdoms of Revelation 17.10. In the realm of evil, all systems are subordinate to paganism, papalism, and Protestantism spiritualism. These are the same as and identical with the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. These are the powers that Satan personally superintends and has invested them with his own power, seat, and great authority. It is in this sense that atheism and Islam must be viewed as they are simply a subcategory of these three great persecuting powers. Okay, so there's all kinds of assumptions here, all kinds of misleading statements. But there's so, no, there, there is no point of proof. Well, yeah, he's, he's not showing any of this. He's stating right. things, which he tends to do. He just tells you things. And some of them are wrong. Well, it, it's very much like two plus two equals five and not showing the work as to how you would get there. Yeah. And now, so, you know, even, well, even this idea of paganism, papalism, and Protestantism are the three powers. Now, but we know the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet are the three powers. Um, and, and we know that the dragon is described as the beast in Revelation uh, 12, right? And we know that, like the great red dragon, and we know that that papalism is um, uh, the beast of Revelation 13, and the false prophet is uh, the second beast, the two horned beast that becomes the false prophet. Um, yet we know that uh, we have at the end of time spiritualism, and we don't have pagan Rome operating at the end of time. Papal Rome has sub subsumed it, right? Okay. 
it's, it's absorbed paganism and it's now the manifestation of Rome in, in that sense. When you, when you say subsumed, what is your definition? That means absorbed. It's okay. absorbed, right? It's, uh, it, it, it's, it's really the, it's really paganism in Christian garb, right? It's encompassed it. Yeah, it's encompassed it. Yeah. So, but it, but it's a different manifestation. It's a different counterfeit. It, it has a different dressing to it, but it's still the same thing in essence. Okay. So, so when we look at, uh, the dragon in at the end of time, we're not looking at pagan Rome as the dragon, right? Now you could say, well, paganism, but in that case, it's, it's spiritualism, but it's still not, it's still not the dragon power, right? When we talk about the dragon, you, you understand what I'm saying? Right. Like, I, I could see superficially somebody might say, well, you got the dragon, you got the beast, you got the false prophet, that's 12 and 13, you got the dragon, that's pagan Rome, the beast, that's papal Rome, the false prophet, that's uh, the two horned beast, right? But, you know, he's going to have them as the fourth, fifth, and sixth kingdoms of Revelation 17 10. Of course, we say that those are presidents of the United States, but. We, we understand that it's the ten horns of the beast of Revelation 17 that is actually representative of spiritualism. That's the UN, right? That's the atheism. That's the spiritualism. That's, that's part of that, that system. That's how we understand it. Now, he's not presenting that view. He's not talking about United Nations. He's not really saying who the seventh is here, which is kind of a problem. Right. I mean, he might later, but in this context right here, to talk about the fourth, fifth, and sixth as the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. And then you'll say, well, who's the seventh? Agreed. Right. Okay. Okay. Speaking of atheism during the French Revolution, in the book Great, The Great Controversy, pages 268 to 269, Mrs. White lets us know that many of the nations of Europe had been controlled through the medium of the papacy, but here is brought to view a new manifestation of satanic power. In other words, it is different from any of the preceding satanic powers. Daniel, okay, okay. okay, so he's... Is it different from any of the preceding satanic powers? I don't see how it could be. It's just a manifestation, a new manifestation. Does it mean different manifest, different, right? It couldn't be different. Yeah, it's just satanic power is now being manifested in this time. It's a new manifestation of it. But it doesn't say it is different from any of the preceding satanic powers. So, so what I think he means, what I think he thinks she means is that, that all of these are satanic powers and, and France is a, a new satanic power, right? That's how I think he's interpreting it. Well, it's, I think that's very clear because he says, in other words, it is different from any of the preceding satanic powers. Therefore, he is setting the tone that this is a almost as a separate manifestation, a separate power altogether. Yeah. And, and to me, the satanic power, um, obviously, Satan is working through all these kingdoms of the world because he's the god of this world in that sense. Right. But, yeah, it's kind of misleading how he he interprets this. Well, the proof that he's attempting to use from Daniel 1138. Yeah. Daniel 1138 tells us that the papacy will honor a God whom his fathers knew not. That is, his pagan fathers did not know atheism, as this was a new manifestation of satanic power. 
This verse is dealing with the lineage of his pagan fathers, Babylon, Media, Persia, Greece, and pagan Rome, while the preceding verse deals with the lineage of his Christian fathers, remembering again that the papacy is a marriage of both. Atheism is distinct from paganism in that paganism admits of a god, whether the sun god, rain god, fertility god, etc. Paganism also teaches that there's an afterlife. Atheism, on the other hand, admits of no god and no afterlife, period, all science, region, reason, and logic, no supernatural. Okay, so, so one is he's using... A definition of atheism that uh, that's not really used in the Bible. Right. So when we talk about Pharaoh, is Pharaoh an atheist? Yes. Technically. Technically, because atheism in the Bible is a rejection of the true God. Right. Not a rejection of all gods. Right. So modern atheism has sort of taken this view. Well, you know, we just believe in science and reason and logic. But, but that's not the biblical definition of atheism, if we're going to place the word atheism in what the Bible teaches. An atheist's description as well can encompass Mother Earth, right? Yeah, or even science. Correct. Right? So, so science is a belief in science it's a religion right so we have this posturing of atheists that you know they're not religious and they don't believe in the supernatural but but that's just a play on words because they believe the natural to be all that there is right so they believe that everything that exists came from nothing right so this word supernatural is just it's just a pejorative term. It, it doesn't really mean anything. So, so I would say that this is not the, the definition of atheism in the Bible. Really, in the Bible, there is no such thing as what we call atheism. When the Pharaoh, we say he represents atheism, he says, well, you know, who is the Lord? You know, right? he, he, he's not acknowledging the true God. But he definitely believes in false gods, right? Correct. So, so he is the example of what happened in the French Revolution. Now, the French Revolution got rid of the true God, but did it really get rid of gods? No, just replaced them. Yeah, replaced them. The god of goddess of reason or whatever you want to have. You cannot have true atheism in the way that atheists try to define it. There's always a belief in something. If you believe that matter is eternal, then matter is your God, right? If you believe all that exists is, is uh, you know, naturalism, well, then nature is your God. doesn't matter how you try to define it. It's just, it's just a reality of where you think we come from. Right. Either we come from this God who uh, is eternal, um, all loving, all knowing, all powerful, whose purposes are, are the reason that we exist and that our purposes need to align to. If you don't believe in that God. Then you are an atheist, no matter what kind of God you believe in. No matter what kind of belief that you may say that you have, you, you, you are an atheist to that true God. And that's all we're saying that atheism is to represent. It's where something else is put in the place of God in that context. Now, we define this because when we have papalism, papalism tries to say that they are worshiping the true God, right? So they don't claim to be atheists. They don't claim to be re rejecting the true God. But are they? Almost assuredly. Yeah. 
So, so that's the difference with uh, something like uh, the papalism compared to something like paganism, which you could say, well, they're both theistic, but but really, from a biblical perspective, uh, they're both atheistic, um, right? So. A lot of the problem here is how we're using these words. So when we talk about uh, spiritualism, we're talking, which which we sort of align with atheism. Um, I think spiritualism is actually a better word than, than atheism because atheism's misused and misleading, and that's why he's having this problem here. Right. Because if you say atheism and spiritualism are equivalent, would we say uh, spiritualism is distinct from paganism? No, we wouldn't, right? But we're going to say they're both the same, that paganism is spiritualism and that atheism is spiritualism. Does that make sense to people, this this problem of definitions? So, So remember, when we looked at verse 38, we translated it as, but as to the almighty God, shall he honor in his place that is in the human heart. Yea, he shall honor a God, a counterfeit Christ, whom his fathers knew not with gold, silver, and precious stones and pleasant things. So we have quite a different translation than the King James. Now he's going to say the God whom his fathers knew not is the strange God of atheism, right? That's his argument. Correct. Okay. So, and that's just completely wrong. That's not what the verse says. And that's that's a pretty strange interpretation. No, no pun intended. I'm a strange God. Okay, go on there, Dwight. Okay. Because of this, atheism <clears throat> is the strange God of verse 39. It is a strange God because of its claim that God or any form of a God cannot exist yet it becomes a god itself. This is manifested in the atheistic theory of evolution, which removes God as the creator and sets itself up as the creator of all things. 1 Samuel 28.13 helps us to better understand this concept in the account of the response to King Saul by the witch of Endor. I saw gods ascending out of the earth. Atheism ascends from the bottomless pit and the spirituality wicked realm of the earth as a strange God. Yeah. So we would say the strange God is this new syncretistic Christian God, this mixture of paganism with Christianity. Right. He says it's atheism. Understanding this, this verse, Daniel 1139, goes on to tell us that the papacy acknowledges the power of atheism, increases it with glory, and then divides the land for gain, that is, gain to the papacy. This verse... This is really bad. I'm sorry to interrupt you. No, you're fine. But this this is so bad. I mean, he's just putting these two together. We can have the papacy and atheism all in one, right? Right. Anyway, this does the papacy cause atheism to be increased with glory? No. No. Not at all. No, I mean, this is the thing, because the papacy seeks its own glory. It will not seek the glory of anything else. Yeah, well, it, and, and what it increases with glory is this made-up Christ. Right. Because they're they're part of that whole system, right? They wouldn't be supporting atheism. Because what we had is we had, thus shall he, the papal power, uh, do that is advancing uh, against the most strongholds, uh, that is, uh, the places of refuge, the truth of God's word, where persecuted Christians have fled for refuge with strange, with a strange God, God, that syncretistic Christian God, whom he shall acknowledge and increase with glory. And he, uh, 
the papal power, uh, shall exercise dominion over many and shall divide uh, the land for gain. Now, of course, this is talking about in the past. This is talking about the history during the 1260. Now, he's not really clear where he's placing this exactly. Whether he's saying that, you know, this is a characteristic of papacy at the end of the world, world promoting atheism or whatever. Okay, go on. He's going to talk about the time period when atheism was. So he's going to actually mention specifically the time period. Right. This verse applies to both the time period when atheism arose and also beyond to the end of time. Instead of fighting against the papacy, atheism is used by the, pap the papacy to receive to reach a class of people that she herself cannot. Okay, well, so would we put this in the future, or are we going to just deal with this as the way that the papacy acted in the past? Well, and I think I would say it's the past. And the reason why I would say that is because it's talking about this papal power and how it's developing in this period of the 1260 years, right? Before the time of the end, before 1798. Well, Placing it that atheism is, in a manner of speaking, a tool of the papacy is something that I don't think we've seen expressed either by the pioneers or those that have opposed the pioneers. I mean, Satan is behind all of these things, and Satan uses whatever he needs to use. Um, you know, like I know there are people who say that the papacy created Islam, for instance. I mean, there might be paper people that say the papacy created atheism. I don't know, but I just wouldn't think that that's correct. I mean, what happened in France wasn't created by the pa by the papacy. No, it wasn't. Yeah, in in, in a sense, it was a reactionism to uh, the oppression that had happened in France because of the papacy's control over um, the civil power, right? So basically the papacy controlled, it, it, it suppressed the people, the, you know, the average person. Um, but in some ways it gave a free ride to, to the upper class, right? It, it, it allowed them to rise up and become richer. Right. Because religion was used by the state in order to to benefit itself uh, at the expense of the common people. So, it's, it, I mean, it's a it's a simplification of things. But but in part, um, I mean, first, they're going to start dealing with. Um, uh, yeah, there, there's a lot of history in there, but, you know, I mean, they're going to be killing uh the elite, but they're also going to be attacking the church, right? So that's going to, both are going to be their enemy. And, and I don't know, atheism used by the papacy to reach a class of people that she herself cannot, I don't think makes any sense, either in the past or even in the future. The issue with this, I'm having to, to recall that when Islam would be on the ascendancy. It was to counter the ascendancy of the papacy. Mm -hmm. And that when the papacy was on the decline, so would Islam be on the decline. Mm -hmm. And this is a historical representation that we can address in multiple ways. Also, his sentence there, instead of fighting against the papacy, atheism is used by the papacy. I think he must mean instead of fighting against atheism. Atheism is used by the papacy to reach a class of people that she herself cannot. No, he's what he's trying to say is that atheism is not fighting the papacy. And that that type of premise does not make sense. Atheism definitely is fighting the papacy. Yes. Okay. And 
and even when I when I look at atheism, you know, um, historically, especially in the 20th century, um, I think primarily it is a reaction to papal ideas. Um, you know, something like the eternally burning hell and torture and so forth that that the papal God uh, does. Um, that's one of the arguments for atheism. You know, if God is a God of love, why is he going to torture people forever and ever and ever in unimaginable torture? Right. And a lot of the atheists that I have seen, like not the new atheists, but the atheists of the past, you know, atheists in the 70s, almost always um, their attack on religion was really attack on the Catholic Church because that's the church they knew. Right. So it was often, you know, they were raised Catholics, went to Catholic schools, you know, they had bad experiences with priests and nuns. And and so they became atheists. They didn't believe in religion. That would be the most common, especially in in uh, atheists I knew from England and so forth. Right. Um, so almost all atheists were, in a sense, reacting to mistreatment through the Catholic Church. The average person wouldn't be an atheist, even if they weren't religious. They wouldn't, they wouldn't claim to be an atheist. Now we have the new atheism, which is a different sort of species, but okay. It makes sense what he's trying to do, I guess, in his context. Okay. This is accomplished through the medium of education of which there are only two kinds, the true and the false. Each system of education produces its own system of thought, which in turn produces the necessary mindset required for allegiance. This is okay. how the... Uh, another yeah. com Do you have a comment on that? Or? Well... Or anyone? The manner in which he's approaching that is a little strange. Well, he tends to like to use dichotomies, right? Either or, right? It's true or false. Um, you know, we have two choices. Now, of course, the world's a bit more complex than that. Now, it is true that there is true education and there's false education. Um, normally, what we experience is kind of a mixture of both. But, but he has this same idea that he expressed regarding methodology, that somehow a methodology will produce, there's like two kinds of methodologies and it produces this or that, right? And I mean, obviously I, I you know, I didn't go through a proper education system. I went to, you know, the public schools, you know, of course I was always a rebel a bit, but, um, I don't think the education that I had produced a sort of system of thought um, in the sense that God was always there. And, you know, that's one of the reasons why I questioned everything, because, you know, I believe God was working in my life to make me observe things. Um, but obviously studying the Bible, you know, that helped me sort out all kinds of things about myself and about the world around me. Um, so I just don't think it's as black and white as this is what I'm trying to say. And, you know, there's a lot more than just education. There's entertainment, there's culture. There's so many other things that really affect us. And, and while I believe in true education, especially homeschooling by, you know, godly parents, um, I think he puts, and I think a lot of people, put way too much emphasis upon education. Uh, obviously, when it gets into the higher levels of education, I think that's when it actually most of the damage is done, when people accept what their professors are teaching. But most kids, you know, education just goes over their heads. It's it's not... Um, it's not really shaping them as much as their relationships with their peers or the music they listen to or the shows they watch or 
or how their parents treat them, those have a much bigger effect overall on uh, on what happens. So, I mean, I understand there's this idea about education and it's, it, you know, brainwashes us. And to some degree, that's true. But it's not so much false education that's the problem. But the, but the remedy to all of the problems is true education, learning in the school of Christ. Oh. Anyway, that's that's the main point. Is just that he tends to like dichotomies as a way of of presenting an argument. We have two choices: this or that, or there's two things: this or that. And and that to me is too simplistic. But um, well, it, it's his reliance upon that there are only two classes being developed, and therefore he wants to extend this understanding of the two classes to everything else that goes on. Right. And, and it's more complicated than that. Now there are two classes, but what produces the two classes? I would say development of the character. It's the everlasting gospel that develops the two classes. Okay. Right. That's what we understand. Okay. The everlasting gospel uh, is a three-step testing prophetic message that develops and demonstrates two classes of worshipers. All right. I would agree. So, yeah. So it's it's the exposure to truth that's going to separate the wheat from the tares, the sheep from the goats, all of those things. Um, so the focus should not be so much on false education and what it teaches, but really upon true education, where it comes from. Of the school of Christ. Um, and, and that's the other thing, is a system of education. So if you're going to say that there's a true system of education, what is that system of education? Where would you find it? Well, from his premise, it would be, it would have to be found all around us in the world. Okay, so you've got a false system, but you have a true you know, it's, it's, I mean, we wouldn't say it's it's advent to schools. No. Right. But what is it? Right. He he doesn't really define that. And, and I wouldn't even call it a system. OK. <laughs> well, you know what I'm saying? Because I think of a system as something that's that's part of an organizational structure in some way, because to learn in the school of Christ is. You may not have any system. You may not have any teachers other than Christ and the experience that you have in listening to God and following his voice and studying his word, right? And the other thing is, like, he, he puts this paragraph in here, but it's not really helpful at all for any of what he's trying to present, right? So to say this is accomplished through the medium of education and present this here. Uh, I mean, obviously, he's trying to say that there is uh, the papacy is working that way. And, and when we look at that history, we can see that the papal schools have um, and the papal system of education uh, really has affected the world the way it is today. So we can say there's a false system of education. Uh, but there is there is a true education. But anyway, it's just not helpful. You know, he's, he's just throwing in, in ideas that aren't really useful in understanding this topic or resolving uh, what he calls these dilemmas. Okay. This is how the papal policy enters, overflows and passes over the countries in Daniel 1140. It is why it is described as a flood in Revelation 12, 15 to 16. It is why even the land of Egypt, the unbelieving world, will not escape. In other words, through the Greek papal system of education that underlies all false ed education, even the unbelieving world will be brought in line to worship on Sunday when the decree goes forth. Atheism is the tool used by the papacy to accomplish its end in the unbelieving world. It is recognized and acknowledged by the papacy as a rival system but it is the papacy that controls atheism and not the other way around. This 
paragraph and these statements are just, I mean, there, there's no proof being offered here. It's just that he's picking and choosing what he wants to say and what he wants to use. No, well, it's not logically and internally consistent in what he's saying. Like, I always question whether he even understands what he's, what his own thoughts. Okay. Well, yeah, I just, I, I, I'm intrigued when he says the Greek papal system of education because he has not established this conjunction anywhere else. Yeah. You know, and we, we had a bit of discussion about this. So now we have Greek philosophy. So so we we look at the Greeks, we look at his well, they provide this false education, right? Now, in some ways, um, you know, what's the difference between what the Jews understood and what the Greeks and the Romans presented as far as as wisdom, as learning? Do we do do we understand the difference? Didn't the Jews understand that all true wisdom comes from God? And right. Greeks and the Romans would make the premise that all true wisdom comes through man. Yeah, so they had a system of logic, right? So that it is that truth can be discerned through reason. Now, of course, God gave us reason, right? And, and Greeks weren't atheists generally. There were some that were. But they believed in some kind of gods. But they would be atheists, of course, in, as far as believing in the true God. But we believe uh, that, you know, God uses reason, but that it's primarily from God's word, from revelation, that we gain knowledge. And, um, and that revelation is connected to experience, right? That is, we have to go through life learning to depend and trust in God. And, and through that, that's the beginning of wisdom. That's where it all starts, our dependence upon God. For knowledge and understanding. Now, in the what we often think of as false education is the system of dependence upon man. That is, the people who have gone before the wise men with all their sayings that that they become the authority, right? Okay. That that's really where false education is. And that wasn't really an idea of the Greeks. The Greeks didn't use um, initially the idea that, well, these great teachers said this before, so it must be correct. Right. Which within papal education. Since it, it, and, and we see this actually happening with the Jews as well, uh, with like um, the Jews the teachings of the rabbis, right? They become the authority over God's word. So in some ways, this, this papal system is a mixture of, of different ideas. But it, it's just so much more complicated than this, right? Um, but also, yeah, he hasn't mentioned the Greek thing before. So there's just... This is just not very thorough and not very helpful in his arguments. This A lot of this seems to be just skirting around actually dealing with any of the real problems. And I'm not sure why he's, he's bringing up these different points. There's no logical train of thought in what he's writing that I, that I can discern. He is trying to make an argument that um, well, I'm not really sure what, the, but that you know that papacy anyway is 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 using atheism, but he hasn't really given any proof of that. Okay. Well, what this reminds me of is um, George Orwell, that uh, article he wrote about. The use of language, or the political use of language. I can't remember the title of it. 
where he talks about propaganda language. Okay. In some ways, the way that he's writing is more like propaganda than, uh, like he's not communicating clearly. He's, you mean 1984? No. The, he wrote a book, he, he wrote an article on the political use of language. Uh, he didn't write it under the name George Orwell. He wrote it under his his actual name, which is I can't think of at the moment. Um, the use of literature as propaganda. Yeah, could be. What's what's what what name does it have it under? His, what's his name? Does it have it as George Orwell? I'm looking. Okay. Yeah, I think. I thought it was the use of language, the political use of language. I think his last name was Blair. Yeah, Eric Blair. Eric yeah. Blair. Anyway, it's a good article to read because he talks about, yeah, politics in the English language, it's called. Yeah, so that article is, it just kind of reminds me. He talks about uh, the impreciseness of language, um, the use of rhetoric, um, just words that have like if you throw in something about Greek papal system of education to Adventists that's just you know we don't know anything about it right like we don't really understand the whole history of Greek education and thought and how it influenced the papal system we don't must much understand about the papal system itself you know we talked before about how um you know there's this papal system of education, which started with basically educating priests and monks. And then we have the Protestants, uh, uh, you know, being influenced by that system of education when they, uh, it's, you know, there's so much detail. It's, it's so easy to kind of have a, a, a black and white, a very sketchy view of all of this. Um, so we need to really understand what's behind false education and what true education is about. But he's just using this as a way of trying to argue that papacy controls atheism. And and it's not that it's the other way around. It's just that these are oppo opposing forces. And atheism we would class with spiritualism. It's one of the three divisions of the world. Right. That would be part of the dragon power and it would be connected to paganism. Right. We could also call it spiritualism. So I would say paganism, atheism, spiritualism. They're just they're all of these things that don't acknowledge the true God. Right. Or, or, or like in on any level. Right. Right. Or the papacy appears to acknowledge the true God, as does uh, the false prophet, right? Protestantism. So that we have this world divided into the papal world, the Protestant world, and everything else, which we could class as atheism, because it doesn't profess to believe in the true God, right? Okay. Hinduism would be atheism. Buddhism would be atheism. Scientism is atheism. Communism is atheism. Worshipping Mother Nature, New Age, that's atheism. We could also class them all as spiritualism. So, so I don't think he's done a good job really defining these words. The papacy seeks to set itself mm -hmm. up as God by claiming to change the law. And atheism seeks to set itself up as God by claiming to be our creator. Both are a direct attack on the law of God and specifically the fourth commandment. These two things will provide the common ground necessary for those who yield to the upcoming Sunday law. Now, so which is true. Everybody's going to be opposed to God's people. That's where they're going to be united in that sense. Okay, go on, Dwight. Sorry, I interrupted you. No, the, the point with this, here again, he raises a, an idea but offers no support. 
because has the papacy attacked the fourth commandment? Yes. Where has atheism attacked the fourth commandment? Definitely not directly. Right. Like not as, you know, as the papacy has done, especially by creating a counterfeit, uh, you know, fourth commandment, if you want to put it that way. It's their third, but. Okay. But also what's not really here is the fact that it's the United States that reaches its hand across the Gulf and the abyss, right, to join hands with these powers. Okay. So, I mean, maybe he'll mention it later. I can't remember. Well, he goes into a point that he extends for quite a while, as in several pages. We'll touch on some of this, but we're going to wind up coming back to it again tomorrow. Okay. A house divided cannot stand. The second overriding principle to consider is that each of these entities, atheism and Islam, in concert with paganism, papalism, apostate Protestantism, spiritualism, are each at war in their own distinct way with God and the Bible. Christ gives us an important principle when considering this in Matthew 12, 25 and 26. Now, he wants to make this the second principle and he wants to have this combination, atheism against Islam, but then having this in concert with paganism, papalism, apostate Protestantism, and spiritualism. Now, we've spent quite a bit of time studying history, as well as studying scripture. Yeah, so history and scripture, yeah. And we have found many points where we're finding that the history that we have studied has been in agreement with the prophecies of scripture. Mm -hmm. Do we see this similar point being addressed with what he's trying to say here? Well, I think first the problem is that, you know, in how we studied, right? So we, we, we started with the scriptures and we went meticulously through the scriptures, reading the scriptures and comparing all of the words, every place they're found in the Bible, uh, bringing in other scriptures, spirit of prophecy comments, trying to understand, uh, what it was we were reading, right? Which which to me is Miller's rules. And we applied also our own history. We could see that there's a repetition of what has happened in the past in our own movement. And, and this gave us light to discern what was going on. Now, he's going to class Protest Protestantism with spiritualism, which makes no sense to me, right? Agreed. Now, his Protestantism have spiritualism in it? Yes. Right? Does the papacy have spiritualism in it? Yes. Right? Because we can define what spiritualism is. It's, it's a rejection of the law of God and uh, a belief that in some way we're eternal, generally speaking. Right? So uh, there's different ways in which that's understood. Uh, based on different religious systems and beliefs. So Protestantism, there are some Protestants definitely are spiritualistic. But as a symbol, Protestantism is not attached to spiritualism. Spiritualism is attached to atheism. Right? Right. But he's never shown us why he wants Protestantism to be spiritualism and why atheism isn't spiritualism. Now, wouldn't he know that most of us would think that spiritualism is atheism? No. 
Because, I mean, that's what's always been taught in the movement. Agreed, but no. So he doesn't know that, you're saying? From the way he's presenting this, I would have to say that he doesn't. Okay. Because this would be a major problem that he's going to have with almost anybody reading this paper who's in this movement. And I, and I don't know of, I mean, I've actually never seen somebody say that Protestantism is spiritualism in the context of Adventism, right? Adventist thought. So, so we have three powers, the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. The dragon power is spiritualism. False prophet is not spiritualism. It's the false prophet, right? It's Protestantism that has become part of Babylon, right? It's going to be the one that, that makes an image to the beast. Papalism, well, that's the beast. So the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. So here he's got atheism versus Islam as the king of the south, right? That's what, why he says atheism and, and Islam, these different en entities. Mm -hmm. And then he says, in concert with paganism, papalism, apostate, Protestant, spiritualism, are each at war in their own distinct way with God and the Bible. So he's saying that all of these powers are against God, right? Which we would agree except that Protestantism slash spiritualism doesn't exist. But it just seems to me just unclear. Okay. And then he's going to give a scripture reference, which doesn't really help us. Well, in the, in the situation that we have here, this gives us a point, I think, for our, our continued conversation tomorrow. Mm-hmm. So if we, if we end on this and we consider how we would view some of this, we can be better prepared for that which we're going to need to address and see if we cannot separate out some of the threads that, that he's attempting to place here to see if we're going to agree with his, his position or not. Mm -hmm. So do we have any other thoughts, comments, or questions from today's study? Well, I just found it kind of funny that Glenn is talking about all, all these powers being in concert, working against against the true God. But then he, he's quoting Christ where he says, every house, city, kingdom that is divided against itself shall not stand. Right. Yeah, it doesn't really make sense why he's using that quote. Okay, thank you. That That is a very good point. Yeah. Consider all of this further tomorrow. Okay. Okay. Shall we now close with prayer? Loving Father in heaven, we thank you for the lessons that you are teaching us. We thank you, Father, for your blessing, for your guidance for the opportunities that we have to represent your name and your character to all of those with whom we come in contact. Direct our steps today. Show us that which you would have us to understand. May your will be done. Help us, Father, so that we may walk on the path that you would set our feet upon so that we may truly join with you. For this, we thank you and this, we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen.